Welcome to NFL Daily, where we enjoyed Nadal Katraz while it lasted. Nadal Katraz? I don't know. Beyond lucky today to be joined by Bo Wolf of PHLY, a tennis player like myself. He embarrassed me at the Super Bowl a couple of years ago. A lot coming up on today's show. We got some news. We're going to do some Eagles talk, a little deep dive, and then we'll play a game, Bo, where I ask you how concerned you are about various factors of the NFC East. Welcome to NFL Daily for the first time. Thank you for having me. You did, you did a good job with PHLY. You've been working on that. I, I appreciate that. I like to say... Oh, uh, I mean, come on. It's it's they couldn't have thought of a different name that you have to spell it out. It's very hard. It's hard, I think. Yeah, I don't, I don't blame you. You worked on it. You, you, you workshopped it. I would say uh, once a teammate, always a teammate, but it's nice to feel like even more of a teammate of, of Jordan Rodriguez again. So I'm happy to be here. Oh, yeah. I love uh, having Jordan on him. I'm glad you, you mentioned her. She will be out at Rams camp. Uh, we'll tape there on Thursday, but we're going to do news, you know, rest of the league stuff other than just Ram stuff, but she'll be there to help us out there. And yeah, I apologize if I'm distracted today. I apologize to you, Bo. Apologize to Randy, uh, who's producing the show, the listeners, because my tortoise is missing right now. Your tortoise is missing. Yeah, I, I, let, I let her out in the backyard. And as I do sometimes, usually pretty, you know, get her some exercise, have some, have some fun. Nori. Uh, is her name, as Randy knows. And um, yeah, I couldn't find her. I couldn't find her, and it was time to do a show. And, you know, that's how much I value NFL Daily, that we're here, we're taping. Who knows? Maybe my my tortoise is out on the street selling her body for, for money. I, Who knows? Yeah, but I mean, it's got to be a slow getaway, right? You're going to have some time <laughs> to catch up. There, There is no real escape, so that's why I feel pretty safe and I felt comfortable. You know, she likes to, you know, maybe she dug a hole somewhere that I can't find. Usually I know where all of her hiding spots are, so I, I will be thinking about that. And yeah, if uh, if you if I seem a little distracted, she's, you know, she's one of the loves of my life, Nori. Uh, well, I feel like I've, I consume a lot of Greg Rosenthal <laughs> content, and I didn't even know that there was a tortoise here. So this, yeah. is, this is news to me. I hope, we, I, saw, I, hope I see her, him or, or her, I guess. Yes. Poking around in the in the background and I can let you know. Yeah, it, it would be funny if she she opens the door to the garage and just uh, climbs up. On It'd my be better shoulder. if she uh, appeared on my end. <laughs> that would be an amazing trick. Uh, let's do some news. Let's get going. News. Yeah, if I keep this show shorter than usual, that's why it's like I got to get <laughs> out there and save my girl. Uh, not a ton of news today, but DJ Moore signed a four-year, $110 million contract, $82.5 million guaranteed on that deal. He already had a couple years left on, on his old deal, so they, they were getting work done early. The Bears just keep making smart moves. I, I don't kind of know how to, to deal with this world, Bo Wolf, where the Bears seem like they're a well-run organization suddenly. Yeah, it's interesting. And all the talk of like Caleb Williams entering the league with as good a, a situation as you could expect for a number one quarterback, I think is is fair. It also makes sense from a like a, a planning standpoint. You've got a Dunze on the rookie contract. Keenan Allen's not going to be there forever. So you get DJ Moore locked up. I was also just thinking about DJ Moore and like the impressive run he's had 4,000 yard seasons uh, in six years with like the most mismatch group of quarterbacks you could imagine yeah. like the six quarterbacks he's had six different guys you've got uh end career cam newton right steep decline cam newton then it goes kyle allen mm. your boy teddy bridgewater sam darnold baker mayfield justin fields like to to overcome that group of six quarterbacks and be as productive as he has been like caleb williams is in a good situation now dj moore is in a good situation with a real quarterback Right. And who knows? Maybe the numbers won't even go up. He was 96 for 1,364 yards last year and eight touchdowns. He said he immediately was talking to the front office and people around the building to get Keenan Allen signed up too long term. I think they I think they want to wait and see with Keenan Allen. Not that they wouldn't trust it, but one year left. You can only pay everyone so much. And it's one of those things where it's twenty seven million dollars in new money average. But if you spread it out it's it's quite a bargain it's something like 20 million dollars a year i i now value contracts of did they make more money than isaiah hartenstein <laughs> in the nba because people are always like wow like this money's crazy and it's like well actually it's less than isaiah hartenstein like jordan love signed the same contract as og ananobi so you know if you could play basketball i would i would suggest do that 
Yeah, I think that's I think that's good. Yeah, DJ Moore young too, so it's, it seems like a good investment. Yes, uh, sneaky young. Somehow only twenty seven years old for all the production that he, that he's had. Uh, let's go to New England where they signed Devon Gotcha to a new contract, while Matthew Judon, who, who we've talked about a little bit on this show, is staying away from the Patriots. And there was a report from the Athletic that that they had offered him a new deal and he immediately went on Twitter and said, they have not offered me a new deal. They're trying to make me look bad. And then the, another report came out from the same reporters, Diana Rossini, who said, well, they actually offered him something before camp and everything. So a lot of drama going on there in New England. It's different. But the, the drama I wanted to hear from you about is about the quarterbacks because apparently ever since I got excited about Drake May on the first couple of days of non-padded practice, he has not played very well. Jacoby Brissett getting more and more of the first team reps and just the fact that Drake May has not played well generally is, is the notion. Ben Volan, and I think he's trying to get some engagement here. I don't mind taking <laughs> shots at reporters. He said Joe Milton's looked more consistent and, and better at camp. It's like Joe Milton's playing with the fourth stringers. Come on. But all, all reports do indicate that, that May has been quite erratic and there might be a little bit of a gap here between Jacoby Brissett and Drake May. I was talking about this on our show with, with Zach Berman today about I think sometimes we lose context of the difficulty of the backup quarterback position in training camp. Because if you mm. think about it, like most defenses play with rotations, right? So the second team defensive line are guys who get on the field. The second team secondary are guys who get on the field. The second team offensive line is usually guys who are not that good. The second team wide receiver options are guys who are not that good. So the deck is usually stacked against the second team quarterback. I think it's a, a thing to keep in mind, but I mean, if Drake may doesn't look good, he, he doesn't look good. I'm excited. The Eagles have a, a joint practice against them next week. So I'll, I'll get eyes on them for you. And it's early. Some really good young quarterbacks have struggled early in training camp and then had great rookie seasons. Obviously there's a million that have struggled early in training camp and had great careers, but even sometimes you see him bounce back later in camp. But yeah, I, I listened to Tom Curran, who's great and Phil Perry, and they just said, just, just not consistently accurate, tough, you know, it's just taking a while for him to make his decisions. And yeah, we, we could be looking at Jacoby Brissett. I'm not, I won't, I won't hate that. I like Jacoby. Well, plus you got Devon Godshaw locked up long term. So all things are, all things are looking up. <laughs> I don't know how Devon Godshaw has got so many contracts and he was upset about his deal, wanted it closer, and then he had he kept practicing. And so I don't know if it's how he, the reason how he decided to handle this or just his situation. Drew Rosenhaus showed up to practice. And Drew Rosenhaus always gets deals done. He's more of a run stopper. Matthew Judon is is a little older and is probably trying to get money into the future is, is my guess. And he's 32 years old and they don't want to deal with it. I like the idea that it's like a, a spite contract they're giving out. Like, well, Let's send a message to Matthew Judon that if he practices, he's going to get a contract. So let's just give Devon Gotcha a tiny little raise just as a shot across Judon's bow. Yeah, I, sh I should have mentioned, yeah, you have a, a daily Eagles podcast, which is a must listen for Eagles fans or for just fans of the league. The, the, the banter is so uh, hardcore. You should feel guilty, Bo, for having the best straight man in the business. Like you're, you're a funny guy and, and Zach is just like a perfect straight man because he either doesn't get the jokes or he's just... I don't know. It's perfect. Nobody, uh, nobody works harder than Zach. He's he's a wonderful partner, and uh, we we welcome you to the the daily podcasting world. Yeah, it's it's a lot, a lot of planning. So a couple a couple more stories. The Dolphins. I wanted to talk about just that. There's been a collection of stories, and I heard from our friend uh, Handsome Hank Henry Hodgson, who who was surprised the Dolphins didn't get mentioned in our, our segment we did on teams we haven't talked about. Enough. I do want to get to the football of it all because this is a very interesting team but it's it's more the off-field stuff that i want to mention in today's news just a collection of stories i've noticed and it, like one after another i was like okay this is too much number one there was that jordan poyer quote he, he's a safety on the dolphins now and he was talking about when he was with the bills and he was saying you know when when we played against this team in the past few years you get a sense that like this team's gonna fold if you if you get ahead of them this was kind of a soft team so i came here to, to change that it's like okay that's your safety. First of all, there was a lot of great back and forth Dolphins Bills game, including a playoff game where Skylar Thompson almost beat the Bills and a game in the snow where it was like a classic. So I, I push back on the accuracy of that, but it's funny that he's telling his teammates that they always would fold. Then uh, at Tuesday's practice. And also, they, I'm the guy who's going to fix that for you. Like, it's right. a very, like, 
<laughs> like, and Bills fans will tell you that Jordan Poyer is not coming off a great year. And I know he got top 100 ranking and a lot of people kind of raised their eyebrows at that, the top 100 players. The players are always a couple years behind what's going on on the field. Then yesterday, Tyreek Hill said that this fight that they had at, at practice, which was significant, uh, said the fight was amazing, that we need that. Teams I've been on and that have won, they fought. That they haven't had enough fighting in Miami. And then Jalen Ramsey at the end of practice had this conversation talking to the whole team, say, again, kind of encouraging them, saying it was good, saying they need to be the bullies. And all this talk about, like, uh, we need something about that worries me. I have another one, but I, wa I want you to get in here. Like, something about that, if you're coming into camp and your main message is the thing that's gonna get us over the top is we gotta talk about that we're tough guys now. I feel like that's a bad sign. Well, I also have to say, without getting too into it, that the idea of Tyreek Hill, of all people, yes, saying that yes. like relationships yes. depend on fighting is uh, a little bit awkward to, to hear. That is fair. Mike McDaniel also mentioned coming into training camp that the focus for him, and didn't want to forget the big picture, is that this organization has not won a playoff game in 24 years, which is wild. That's, that's insane. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, they've only made it twice with McDaniel. And the first year was a, a great season by them to even make the playoffs. So I, I do not give them any penalty for losing that game. Last year, they lost to the Chiefs. Uh, but he changed the clock. Um, or not the clocks, but he changed the meeting times throughout the offseason to be at 7.24 a.m. or 3.24 a.m. or 5.24 p.m. or whatever it's going to be to remind him how it's been 24 years. And somehow when I add up all these stories, I feel like this is a team that's in their own head a little bit. I, d I don't like it. Yeah, like I you know, I think Mike McDaniel's a smart guy. I'm sure he knows uh, and has thought a, a lot more about th this messaging than I have. But yeah, like the leaning into, oh man, we have really sucked for a long time <laughs> is always a bit of a, a bit of a red flag for me. So, I, you know, I, I hope it works out for them. It certainly seems like this is a, a team with a lot of pressure on them to get over. That hump, right? Uh, this, well, that's this, it. Yeah, like like this group, this core, like the, their best players are not going to last forever, right? And how many chances are they going to have? It's it it is it does seem like a team that is very much um, well, like in its own way a little bit, right? In its own head. I have a theory. It it, it applies to the 49ers. It would have applied to the Celtics if they had lost the NBA Finals again. I thought that was why it was so important. They got this one. Was I think the worst mm -hmm. thing you can be in sports is the team that has all the bad things that come along with winning a championship, like that you ha you ha a championship or else, or it doesn't feel good, all this pressure, the disease of more, everyone wanting more money, all of this stuff happening, but you didn't actually win anything. Like, yeah, at least you need to have won it to have to go through that. And so if you get keep getting close and close, and the Dolphins are like the worst version of that, which is they haven't even won a playoff game, but I still feel like they're in their own head and are having some of the issues that people that the teams that come up just short have and yet you know they're they're kind of like a borderline playoff team well it's also funny because the the jordan poyer of it all like it seems like very similar to what they were yes. dealing with with the bills right like the dolphins were were looking in the division and like oh we we need a little bit of that all or nothing anxiety and uh and jordan poyer has brought it okay some quick injury news just before we uh take a break and then talk some eagles uh nick bolton and Kadarius tony got injured at chiefs practice on Wednesday, the Bolton was an elbow injury. Tony was an ankle injury. I don't know if Kadarius Tony makes this team. I know he had that that moment against your Eagles where he broke my heart. I don't know if he broke your heart. Do you have to pretend like you don't care if the Eagles win the Super Bowl or there's, not? Or there's no pretending at all. I'm I'm a, okay. objective as it gets. Although I will say that year we would have at least had a like the Athletic was going to put out a uh, like a commemorative issue of our article. Mm. So that was the one thing. And also, Zach, I think, maybe had a book deal in, in place. So that was, <laughs> he might have been rooting harder than I was. That's amazing. Um, well, I, have to, I don't try to pretend either. I was rooting hard for that Eagles team. I really enjoyed them. But I don't know if Tony makes that team. It didn't sound great with Bolton, but with all these injuries, we, we have to wait and, and find out. But he's, he's obviously very important for them. We were at Chargers practice earlier this week. Junior Colson, who they think might start as a rookie at middle linebacker, off the NFI list. I mentioned Roman Wilson, the receiver for the Steelers, still is had an ankle injury. It's week to week, so maybe not quite as bad as, as they feared, but also not great. And then, yeah, a reserve tackle, the Broncos, Quinn Bailey, fractured his ankles and had to be taken to the hospital today, which is, is a tough scene. So hopefully he gets better. Bo, we're going to take a quick break. 
while I actually leave you and through the magic of podcasting, I'm going to go find that, that damn tortoise. <laughs> oh, no. How did, <laughs> how did Randy make a graphic already? That's next level. That is actually Nori. I recognize her. Uh, we'll be back after this. Back on NFL Daily. Didn't find her. Uh, throw that graph up, up again. Randy gets Producer of the Day Award for finding a, a picture of Nori. Apparently, on uh, my other podcast, JRVP Reddit board. I miss you, girl. I'll, I'll find her. I, uh, I want to talk about the Eagles. I, we, we want to deep dive. We're making a, a big board bow of all the teams we're going to deep dive uh, throughout the preseason and, and into the season. Eagles, one of the first teams I wanted to hit and no better person to talk to than you, I- including Zach Berman, who you host the show with. <laughs> you know, I, I made a choice. I, I think, I think you're a better choice. And, uh, let's start with Jalen Hurts. Let's, let's be obvious. You like on your show to talk about like the third string pass yeah, rushers but this or is whatever. mass audience. Yeah. This is right. not the, yeah. Okay. And yeah, Zach likes to talk about the big names and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a basic and you're right. This is, this is for the national audience. I think Jalen Hurts is one of the most fascinating players in the league this year because he went from one of the best Super Bowl performances of all time in my mind yeah, and getting MVP votes to this off season being about QB 13 or 14 in, in most people's minds. Like that, that ESPN thing where they talk to the executives, QB 13. Went, went to Steven Ruiz on ESPN, QB 13. And it's like everyone thought Jalen Hurts' one season was this fairy tale, but that their evaluations of him coming into the draft were kind of bogus, and now they've proven him right. Uh, that annoys me, but it, it's, a new, it's a new offense. I've heard that he, he's looking pretty good at training camp. Give me, give me the state of Jalen Hurts right now. Well, the other thing you forgot is the the big long offseason conversation of the relationship with Nick Sirianni and the like passive aggressive talking past each other that that happened in a couple of their their press. It seems like a real thing. I don't think it was a media creation. No, and it, it, there are there are you know like every now and then uh, there will be a little correction sent to the reporters because Jalen Hurts, uh, for instance, is talking about the players that he threw within the offseason and forgot one guy. He doesn't want to leave anybody out. But when mm. he says the uh, 95% of the offense is new and, you know, doesn't necessarily take up any of the sort of softball question opportunities to defend Nick Sirianni. There are no such corrections made. Mm. Uh, I think those things are, are notable. But listen, like the quarterback and the head coach don't have to be best friends for them to be successful. You know, look at look at New England, right? Um, I think the the Jalen Hurts, what is so difficult when you are evaluating him is disentangling all the variables, right? Like he had that unbelievable season in 2022, that Super Bowl, he was amazing, but he also had maybe the best weapons in the league and the best offensive line in the league. And it was the first time in the past, like eight years of his career when he had the same play caller for the second season in a row, all of those things coalesced and and he looked awesome. Last year, you know, new play caller and the offense gave him no answers, right? Um, and it's very clear in in what the Eagles did this offseason and sort of taking the offensive play calling and structure away from Nick Sirianni that they viewed that as probably the main problem. You know, they, mm-hmm. they, they, they did not provide him a ton of answers uh, against the Blitz. You know, there was no, they were the 32nd in the league in motion. They were dead last in a lot of these sort of structural categories. But... There are also things that Jalen Hurts himself needs to do better. And I think it's going to be interesting to see in the Kellen Moore offense, he has looked good the first week of of camp, which comes after he didn't look so great in the spring. Um, The ball was not coming out super on time. It looked like there were a lot of moving parts in in terms of him learning the offense. This is the problem with a daily podcast, though. Like, you guys, I'm not blaming you, but it's tough to... It's tough to get, take too much away from OTAs and minicamps. I of fall, course, I fall into that trap too. But saying anyone was good or bad in OTAs minicamps is is tricky. No, but it it's <laughs> contextual in that when he came back for like the first week of camp, things did look different. The ball was coming out Fair. on time. Uh, he he looked better. He has looked very good. The other thing from last year that that we haven't even, we haven't talked about yet is you know his his running superpower was not as much of a part of the offense. You know, there was, there's the tush push. Yeah. 
but he was not as dynamic in the open field. There were a lot of times when he would just sort of scramble around and then just throw the ball away, which he did not do in 2022. He has looked spryer this this year. The Eagles are also seem to be incorporating like day one stuff, quarterback run as part of the offense. So it seems Ooh. like that's going to be uh, in the offense. And I, I think it, it has to be like that's that's what makes Jalen Hurts as as good as he was in 2022, that it changes the math on offense. It changes everything that they have around him. So uh, there's no doubt that like Jalen Hurts is the most important person in the organization uh, as to their success this year. So far, so good. But but we will see how it goes. That That is big news if they follow through with that in terms of his running and yeah he wasn't healthy a hundred percent last year and I've seen how high he's getting taken in fantasy leagues they're not worried about the Jalen Hurts hype like he's still going third third fourth round like it's a third quarterback and he needs to run to to make that worth it but he's still got maybe the best collection of skill players The, the offensive line has taken a couple hits but you would still assume that it's an asset versus, you know, average or, or anywhere below that. I, w- I would assume that. And if you've got age, I mean, if you've got AJ Brown, Goddard, Devonta Smith and Saquon Barkley on the same team, that almost there isn't a team out there. I, I don't think that can quite match that or, or it's going to be close. And it, it makes me happy because I do not want the Carson Wentz thing to happen because mm. <laughs> because it is kind of crazy how they they really are reliving a. I mean, with slight variations, the whole, you know, tracking of what happened after they won their first Super Bowl. The next year is yeah. similar-ish, ish. I mean, they actually looked pretty good in the playoffs that year and could have could have gone further the, the the year they were defending the title. But they give once the big contract and and it's just like this slow little decline and they never quite quite respond. I don't know. I hope. Yeah, that I mean, you 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 would have to think if it goes that way, which you know it probably won't. But then all of a sudden, like, what is it about? the organizational structure that that allows that to happen if it happens twice you know it's it, maybe it's not on him it's on us well i want to get to that maybe it's on the fans I, I blame the philly fans for a lot the front office dynamic is weird howie roseman has obviously done a, a really good job on on balance and the talent's obvious but when they're out publicly saying more or less that he chose the coaches that's weird. That's a little weird. Yeah, T- to me. And he, he, I, I noticed he was, you know, he was saying how they, they're hoping to play young players this year more often, which are you know Howie's players. And so that, that's a, it's a weird. And Vic Fangio is the coach, who's not a guy who necessarily plays young players. So that dynamic to me is strange. That Nick Sirianni is there, but the front office is really running the show in a way more obviously than than most places. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm of two minds here. Um, on the one hand, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal that like Howie Roseman would be the one making the connections for bringing in Vic Fangio and, and Kellen Moore. Like if you just think about it, he has been around the league longer. He has more connections. Uh, Nick Sirianni sort of exhausted his connections. His, you know, his top guys both left in, in Shane Steichen and Jonathan Gannon. That We have seen this over the years. It's very difficult to replenish your like coaching pipeline. Um, but there's also no and doubt bringing some fresh minds like Matt Patricia into the organization. Yeah, exactly. Like solve everything. Give me a break. Um, but there's no doubt that that Howie Roseman is the most like most powerful person in the organization, and much more so than than mm. Nick Sirianni. Um, there was the you know there was the 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 big report from Seth Wickersham and uh, and ESPN about their flirtation with with Bill Belichick, um, which I think was was very real. And and there's the characterization that that I do think is fair that. You know, Howie Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie are to some degree um, sort of like art collectors of the NFL. Like they like bringing in these these people who who have been in the zeitgeist. And so like the Vic Fangio <laughs> defense, they have Jonathan Gannon, who who seems like he's trying to run the same thing. Last year, they bring in Sean Desai, who who worked under Vic Fangio. This year, they actually get the guy Vic Fangio like they got the the original Rembrandt that they were looking for. But there is a bit of a tension between. Fangio and and Howie in terms of their like philosophies because the like the Howie Roseman defensive foundational philosophy for so long has been as many pass rushers as possible we want to rotate these guys keep them fresh so that they're fresh at the end of the season uh you know it goes back to the Andy Reid fastballs that that Eagles fans are familiar with but Vic Fangio 
is is not of that ilk. Like he wants to to play his guys at a high percentage. Christian Wilkins last year played more snaps than any defensive tackle in football. Uh, I asked Howie about this at the the first press conference of training camp, and he said. Yeah, like we are going to have to be a little bit different. Like in the past, we would have guys mm. play like 55% of the snaps and it might need to be more like 65, 70. And so, uh, you know, Jalen Carter, who could be awesome, but he's going to have to play a lot more snaps. Jordan Davis is going to have to play a lot more snaps. Those guys, it's going to be interesting, especially because last year, I think that was a big factor in why their defense was so bad at the end of last year. They're, the guys were exhausted. So there's been a lot of talk of, of extra conditioning this season. Feels a little bit, overcorrecting to me but um the 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 howie of it all like if if this season goes wrong nick sirianni is going to be the one who answers for it you know jeffrey Lurie is not going to look at this roster and think well the roster wasn't good enough it's it's going to fall on nick right and you mentioned davis and jalen carter to me if i had to pick one thing on the defense i guess but but one thing on this team that's like, are they going to be better than people think or worse than people think? It might just be those two taking a step up each. Like, not that Jordan Davis needs to be an all pro, but Jordan Davis needs to be more consistent and a plus starter that can handle a big workload and and make it through the season. And Jalen Carter goes from a really good player to like an all pro player. Because if that happens, everything else I feel like on the defense will fall enough into place but there there are a lot of questions to me on, on this defense and you mentioned how they didn't have answers for Hertz, and you know it it did get ugly at the end and the, the playoff game was flat out embarrassing really the last month was insanely embarrassing for them but the, the offense was good the whole year before that like the offense was legitimately good it was just First wasn't three great. quarters of the season and okay it, well it, that's it, three quarters of the season they would have yeah. lo- you know loaded up on wins but it, but even even when they were struggling it was like okay they fell back down to average or below when the defense stunk the whole time is is my point is it felt to me like it was more about the defense and now a little worried that Fangio coming off a down year and maybe the league is caught up a, a little bit to what he does w- what have you seen so far at training camp that that's caught your eye for the defense and just just how do you think this this defense goes yeah I mean it's interesting because uh the other thing that is a little bit different about it from a Howie Roseman archetype standpoint is there's there's so much more deep in the secondary, um, and they have always been built front to back. And it seems like the way that they went about building it this offseason is a little bit more back to front. Quinion Mitchell, the first round pick, Cooper DeGene, the second round pick. DeGene's been out, has not practiced yet, is, is sort of week to week. But Keely Ringo, who was a fourth round pick last year, uh, is competing to start opposite Darius Slay. Isaiah Rogers, the guy who was suspended for a season, has actually looked really good and is also competing. They hmm. brought back C.J. Gardner-Johnson at safety, so they they seem much more deep in the secondary than they have ever been. But you're right that it does really come down to either Jalen Carter or Jordan Davis has to take some kind of leap, I think. And I think it's more likely to be Jalen Carter. I think there's a chance that he could be one of the best defensive tackles in football as, as early as this season. Um, they're trying to figure out what they're going to do at linebacker, which is the case every summer with the Eagles. It's Devin White and uh, Nicobe Dean. Yeah, and I've got Zach I've got Bond a bone to pick with you actually like, for your your Eagles linebacker coverage is oh, coverage, let's hear which it. is always like you you talk about linebacker and you're like, well, they got Devin White lo- locked in. We know where we're gonna get out of him. Oh, and then I don't say whether we know what we're gonna get out of whether him. it's Zach Bond or Nicobe Dean next to him. And I'm thinking like Devin White is the last guy in the NFL almost. You know what you're gonna get out of. He drove his coaches crazy, and those are good defensive coaches. He basically. I think t- Todd Bowles like l- lost years off his life for coaching Devin White. Not just last year, really the last couple of years, ever since they won the Super Bowl. And so he got that contract, and I thought, well, that that's an interesting fit there with with Fangio. Uh, and I don't know, like they, it's the one thing that the analytical precepts we talked about three or four years ago of like not paying off ball linebackers mm-hmm. has not come out well in the wash right now it feels like every good defense has great off ball linebackers and teams like the Eagles or the Cowboys or, that don't get absolutely destroyed because of them in, in the playoffs I will not sit idly by and let you paint me as the Devin White <laughs> defender um, yeah there's no doubt about it and and it to the uh, art collector uh, thread they went out like the additions this offseason the Eagles added five different first round picks Devin White Makai Becton Kenny Pickett, uh, mm. like, I mean, you go John Ross, 
But oh yeah, give give me your your picket uh, quarterback battle. Analysis. But all of these so guys, far, just, like you, you think quickly. about these guys, they're gone. They're first round picks with the same regimes. Like those guys are gone for a reason. Like uh, Makai Becton, in theory, is a good answer at right guard. But you know, don't the Jets need offensive linemen? Don't couldn't couldn't the Bucks need Devin White? But yeah, my my picket thought, and that's why I brought up the thing at the top about how difficult it is for this number two quarterback. But I have not been impressed with with Kenny Pickett so far, and I actually really do like. Tanner McKee, who is the number three quarterback, who was their sixth round pick last year. He's getting the ball out much quicker, much more on time, much more accurate. Uh, I have been underwhelmed with Pickett so mm. far. I love it. And sorry for, for cutting you off in the middle of trying to defend Devin White. Yeah, a lot of just a lot of questions. And they bring in Bryce Huff. You I know you've you've kind of had your eye caught by Jalex Hunt. They're they're uh Yeah, a little flash. So the third they're, round. They're pick. a little thinner there in terms of passers. They kind of need I would say they basically need Bryce Huff to work. Not not be a star. He doesn't need to be as good as Hassan Reddick, but he needs to at least be what he was for the Jets or a little yes. better. Yeah, I mean, he, he was very efficient last year, and so if he's even a little bit less efficient than that, but with more volume, that would be a good sign. Vic Fangio didn't necessarily gas him up a ton in his first press conference. He said he hasn't yet proven that he can be a, a three-down player. But I think mm. that's just kind of a nice, you know, crusty old defensive coordinator answer. The other guy involved there is Nolan Smith, their second first round pick from last year, who had a very underwhelming rookie season. Um, if it's not Bryce Huff taking a leap or Josh Sweat looking like he did, you know, the first half of last season, it needs to be Nolan Smith being playable because last year he wasn't. And to be fair, that's sort of like the Howie Roseman thing about play these young guys. Like if Nolan Smith and Keely Ringo had gotten on the field a little bit more Last year, maybe they would be in better position this year. I mean, they got a lot of guys. They got a lot of names. I think if you if you pulled just average NFL fans and you named all the players on on the teams, like the Eagles would be among, if not the league leader, in just names that you recognize. Even guys like Keely Ringo, who who were famous in college, and you know, we didn't mention Jason Kelsey's gone. Of course, that's uh, important. But they have a guy that's that's been there a couple of years, that's ready to go and take the spot in Cam Jurgens. Overall, to me. They have more talent than than the rest of the division. And I think the expectations actually should be pretty high for this Eagles team. It's weirdly not because last year ended, at least nationally, because last year ended so ugly. But the roster is as good or better to me as it's been the last two years. And they're the ones that blew it last year. To me, the expectations should be like Super Bowl contender. Uh, I don't see I why not so. in the NFC like that. They're one of the top two or three contenders, but I don't get the feel that, that people see them that way. I think that's right. When you look at the roster uh, and you look at the division, which which I know we will get to, it's it's underwhelming. Um, the only thing that that, you know, is the uh, contrarian in me that is a little bit wary is two new coordinators is often more difficult than it, it looks on paper. That that takes some time. And then on offense, like. They need to be awesome. They need to be a top five offense, and I think I think Jalen Hurts is ready for that. But if the offensive line goes from one of the three best in the league to like the eighth or ninth best in the league, that makes a big difference. And they're very top heavy. You know, they're they're a little bit more deep on defense. On offense, it's kind of like stars and scrubs. Like their number three receiver right now is maybe Paris Campbell, maybe John Ross, maybe a sixth round pick Johnny Wilson. And I know that John like, Ross. No. And I know, and I know that John if Ross you, is not making that team. Don't invest too much. Yeah, that's well, what I'm, I think that's I'm, that's most likely right. But I, I, I like I know that if you looked at every roster in the league and you were like, well, who's their number three receiver? That it would be it would, it would n- nobody's going to blow you away. But they have been very lucky with health for AJ Brown and Devonte Smith over the past two years. I don't think that they are well suited to replace those guys. I think internally they would say. If something happens early, maybe they can make a trade. Um, you know, they've got extra hmm. pick investment from this year. I would, I would be surprised if they, you know, enter the second half of the season with this exact wide receiver core. Hmm. But they didn't necessarily. It was the one thing of the offseason that surprised me that they did not address sort of the fourth option in the passing game a little bit more. Now maybe you I mean, can, get, you you're have willing Potter, to buy Saquon, that it's maybe. Saquon. It's Saquon. Well, yeah, but that's another one where having been through this a lot over the past decade, like, oh, this is the this is the year we're going to throw to the running back. It doesn't usually pan out that way. That said, Jalen Hurts has looked more comfortable throwing to the running backs this summer than he than he has in years past. The Eagles have thrown to running backs less often than like any team in the league over the past couple of years. It seems like that's probably more of a Jalen Hurts thing than an offense thing. But maybe it's as simple as 
well, Jalen Hurts didn't want to throw the ball to Kenny Gainwell, but it's Saquon Barkley, so he'll throw him the ball. Yeah, I'm excited. I think Saquon played much better a year ago than the numbers would indicate. And behind this offensive line, I just think it's going to be very different. Even if it is the eighth or ninth best offensive line, that's way better than he's ever played behind uh, with the Giants. So I think they've got everything they need, but you're right. The coordinators are high, high ceiling and maybe a low floor for both of them. Like Kellen Moore could be great. Vic Fangio could be great. It could be the Vic that we've, we've had in our minds the last, few years the the one they had in their minds when they brought him in before the super bowl right and then they had the worst defensive uh performance they had all year and they blew uh their chance to win a championship let's do let's do a segment here let's play a little game before we go and get go a little more big picture in terms of the nfc east i want you to rate one to 100 on a level of like philly angst i'm going to okay. give you different aspects of the division one being we're climbing it, grease it, poles. It's and, the day after the Super Bowl, okay. and you're calling into to the you know PHOI. You know you, everyone's yeah. happy, and then a hundred being Matt basically Patricia. any other day in Philly sports <laughs> history. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so all right, let's start with um, Joe Shane. Uh, his front office moves, and yeah, the front office of the Giants. I I do have to say that this hard knocks. I think it's the best content the NFL has ever produced, aside from this podcast. <laughs> wow. Uh, it is so good. And it it's so good at like laying bare um how silly the uh like like gatekeeping of all information is when everything they're showing is so mundane and it's like Brian Dable's talking about he's going to hire this defensive coordinator. Well, look, it was like eighth in uh rushing yards allowed last year. Like that's as deep as it's going. Um <laughs> <laughs> but the Shane stuff, to think of it through the prism of everything they're showing has been approved by the Giants. And they are just letting him out to dry, making him look like such a boob. Um, like the the Saquon of it all, it, it really does feel like if Saquon has a huge year with the Eagles and the Giants are bad, that's going to be the thing that that hangs him. Like he's, he's going to be mm. let go. But I, my other takeaway here is... Uh, I know you and I were texting about the the performance of Joe Shane's son. You know, telling him, "Oh yeah, be aggressive. Go, 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 get the quarterback." That's your, this is that's your assistant. That's your GM right there. If if Shane's not yeah. pulling it this year, bring the son in. But the son needs to be put to work in another way, uh, because it, it really has has gotten to me the uh, the the big player acquisition messaging that Joe Shane has: strength, toughness, determination. Yeah, a fourteen-year-old has got to tell you, Dad, that's STD. Like, <laughs> our whole our whole thing is STD. We, we gotta we gotta watch out for this. Just flip it around; it could be TDs. It's like touchdowns. What are I, we doing? I don't want to be too hard on Shane. Like, he seems like a very good guy. He seems like a very nice guy. <laughs> but I have talked to a few people, and the conversation is kind of like, is there more going on there? Right. Like, are there deeper conversations that we aren't seeing? And the res that's what I'm asking. And the responses that I've gotten is like, no, that's it. That is. <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> to me how surface level all the conversations are. And I, I have thought about this. We were joking about this on our show about the idea of Howie Roseman watching this to me is is so fascinating because I know that it's a little bit played up, but like the surprise of Joe Shane, the first like five minutes of free agency when all these prices are different, like the information game in the NFL between the GMs and the agents and the insiders, like Howie Roseman's been playing this game for so long. I think he would mm. tell you that like he, he takes pride in being as in this as anybody. Like he says the the thing that keeps him up at night is the idea that somebody might be available and he doesn't know about it. The idea that the first 10 minutes of free agency would go by and the cost of the players he wants would shock him is insane to me. And it, it like, it really does seem like Joe Shane is uh, not altogether like knowing what is going on at, at all these different mm. levels. I hope, I hope NFL films is not listening because I agree. It's, it's been some of the best content and not just cause we're having a little fun with it here. You are seeing, some moments and interactions and how things work that we just haven't before because we haven't seen this type of hard knocks before. And I don't think it's bad for, for the giants, but I guess if you listen to this 
segment, they probably wouldn't be a big fan. Let's, let's I thought, go like, positive. I, I Giants, love the the, the, mun, the mundanity though of like the how the trades ha- like you know it's just oh yes. well he's he's friends with Dan Morgan like hey what do you think about uh, what, <laughs> right, what do you yeah, think about this about that like it's crazy. Um, let's stick with the Giants actually. Let's go through the the rest of these fast, but I want to I want to give something positive about the Giants. How about the level of concern one to one hundred? The Giants defensive line going up against this this Eagles group now. A little bit more of a fair fight. It's a good question. I didn't give you the number the last one. I would have said like no. 98 or something like that. But okay. I think for this one, um, I think the Eagles offensive line in particular is, is maybe a little bit less worried, but the, that defensive line looks awesome. So I think I think Eagles fans would tell you this is like a 25, but I think most opposing teams would, would give it like a, a 90. I mean, Dexter Lawrence is as is as good as it gets uh, at defensive tackle now that Aaron Donald's gone uh, from for a nose tackle to be as productive as he is against uh, uh, you know rushing the passer. Brian Burns on the outside is awesome. Um, mm. As much as we sort of poke fun at Joe Shane, it does feel like he like um, accidentally backed into a lot of the right decisions. Like I think the Burns trade is is good value, and it's well, right. It, they didn't like, show much about the Burns trade, and ultimately that was the biggest move they made. I mean, they did talk about how the trade came about, but they clearly prioritized that, and I think. Overall, that was considering their options was was the right move, and they and when they first brought it up, they talked about yeah. they've been you know it would cost a first right, and they right. so they got it for first a much plus. better price. Like the Saquon thing, I actually think they probably did the right thing in in letting him go. I think Malik Neighbors is awesome, um, so they sort of backed into a lot of what what looked like the right decisions to me. But yeah, that defensive line, it, it's it's obviously what that entire defense is going to be built upon. It's the only unit on that team I think that you would look at and say it's definitely above average league wide. All right, one to one hundred. Uh, Jaden Daniels pulling like an RG three rookie year performance against the Eagles, where I believe he had one incompletion and four touchdowns, and, and mm. ran all over him. Concerned? Uh, I think that's that's like an eighty five for the Eagles because mm. you also have to keep in mind that Sam Howell diced up the Eagles, mm. so they have not had a lot of luck against those uh, rookie Washington quarterbacks, but. You know, the the Devin White of it all that we're talking about, like the, the middle of the field for the Eagles, the linebackers are not going to be great. And so um, if Jaden Daniels is as explosive as a runner as he was in college, then, yeah, that's that's definitely something that that will concern them. Justice for um, Eric Bieniemy, by the way, like Sam Howe has gone to Seahawks mm-hmm. camp and like supposedly just is bru- absolutely brutal. And, you mm-hmm. know, they, they made it. They made him look pretty good. I thought I, th- I thought both Scott Turner and. And Eric Bieniemy were kind of underrated with with what they did. Well, in plus uh, speaking being, of which, yeah, how about one to one hundred? I mean, yeah, one to one hundred. Dan Quinn and Cliff Kingsbury as a competition. That's a one. I mean, oh wow, that's rude. I mean, uh, one to one hundred. That that Vic has lost his fastball. Totally, Vic Fangio. This is really still in the team, but yeah, I think that's I think that's a reasonable eighty eighty five. I mean. Mm. Especially those first years, if you look over, you know, Fangio's recent history, the the first years have not been great um, in Denver, even in Chicago, and last year in, in Miami. Uh, my 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 case on on Fangio has been that he was brought in to provide a higher floor, like just a level of competence that they did not have last year with Sean Desai and Matt Patricia. They only need them to be a top twenty defense, and they need the offense to be top five. Um, but I think there's. I, I can't imagine their defense is going to be worse than it was last year, but it could certainly be below average. It could be not good. You, you mentioned being top heavy. There are there are numbers to to back you up there. They actually are second in the league. I saw this year of if you take the top five players on the team, average salary, mm-hmm. they they're over 150 million, and that that that's number two in the entire NFL. Miami actually was one. So just on offense they, or on the whole roster? No, overall. Okay. The pain, and most of that is on offense. I again, I'd push back, but you're right. Most of the the money is into the offense, and it is better talent. I think that I think that's an above average talent to defense. I think that's like a top. That should be a top twelve to thirteen defense, something like that, with with a good coordinator. <laughs> Wrap up with uh, the 2024 Dallas Cowboys. Just stay just stay totally vague with them. You can take from an Eagles more. perspective. Yes, one to one hundred. Yeah, concern. I mean, I think Eagles fans are enjoying the the drama of it all and and how uh, how cheap the Cowboys have been, not not paying their players. But I mean, I think they're still the best competition in the division. I think uh, there is the uh, the contrarian in me that that wants to to say that the Cowboys could even be the favorite because they have uh, the carryover and and some of the best players in the division. Like th- there's a little bit more variance with the Eagles. I think I think the Cowboys will be good. Um, but 
certainly it's it's very funny to watch as all the quarterbacks and the receivers get paid and you know Dak is being talking about oh, well it might be nice to be somewhere else and uh they're not paying anybody else and Sam Williams goes down and so all of a sudden what looked like their uh, best unit on defense is a little bit depleted and they're going to have to lean more into to Mike on the outside but uh for Eagles fans I would say they're they're enjoying this uh nadir of of Cowboys fandom yeah, the Eagles are barely favored to win the division relatively. They're like, you know, minus 125. The Commanders are, I mean, the uh, Cowboys are like plus 165. So it's not a huge gap but between the two. The Cowboys, to me, seem like the boomer bust team in the NFL. Dak is good enough, and the in Parsons and their best players are good enough, and we've seen them be good enough under McCarthy. That 13 wins with the, the out of division schedule isn't bad here because you guys get to play the NFC South. I think the Eagles play three NFC South teams before. September is over, which is a nice way to mm-hmm. start the season after that that Brazil game. Um, so you could tell me they could win 13 games. I don't think that's that crazy for the Cowboys. But you could tell me they won five, and I don't think that's that crazy. I think they're they're pretty high on the list of teams that are favored to make the playoffs that could absolutely implode in many ways. Um, and it's because they're a little top-heavy. It's because of the dynamics with the coach and just the – everything going on. I, I could see that going horribly wrong, at least in some timelines. There's also the concern from Eagles fans that, that Kellen Moore is a sleeper agent for the Cowboys, mm. kind of like Orlando Skandrick was uh, a few years ago, and maybe we'll just rip Moore off Moore would make shirt. more sense because he was there for a decade. Yeah, he, he seemed he like was he was the, Jerry's guy. Yeah, yeah, he was. So He wasn't until he wasn't. Yeah, there you go. You're, you're my guy, Bo Wolf. Um, does a great job. Like I said, P-H-L-Y podcast, Eagles podcast. It's daily. They, they're getting after it. Training camp reports, I, I find it, it's, it's the best way to, to follow a team. And obviously, if you're an Eagles fan, you should check it out. But, but anyone would enjoy the banter. And uh, yeah, Bo, thank you very much. Go get that tortoise. I know. Nori, I'm coming <laughs> to save you. We'll be back uh, to wrap up the week on Friday. We'll be at Rams camp, but we'll, we'll talk about all the stuff going around in the league and, and get some interviews there. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, until then, for Bo Wolf, see you next time. Slow and steady. <laughs>